Hello fellow students. In this video, I discuss the solution of problem 2.1a of Pettin and Schroeder's Introduction to Quantum Field Theory. In the problem, we are given the action of classical electromagnetism in terms of f minu, where f minu is given in terms of derivatives of a, the four factor of electromagnetic potential. We are asked to derive the Maxwell's equations from this action. Let us start from extracting the Lagrangian density denoted by this cursive L by using the definition of the action, that is the integral of the Lagrangian density over all space-time. From here, we can use the Euler-Lagrange equation for field theory, treating A as the, dy the dynamical variables. Working on the first term of the equation, we substitute in L. Here, I change the indices mu and nu to alpha and beta in the Lagrangian to avoid index conflict. We can do that because mu and nu in the Lagrangian are dummy indices. We can then use the product rule on the product of F inside the derivative. Using the definition of f, we can find the derivative of f alpha beta with respect to d mu a nu to be the product of critical delta as follows. We can now substitute in the derivative of f into the derivative of l. For the second term, we can use the same result with written in green by lowering the indices of f before taking the derivative. Here, I lower the indices by multiplying f with, with g alpha lambda and g beta kappa. Distributing f alpha beta into the green parentheses, we can use the property of chronicle delta, where indices can, ch can change according to the chronicle delta's indices. In the second term, we can raise the indices of f alpha beta using the g alpha lambda and g beta kappa, leaving the chronicle deltas alone for a moment. Finally, we use the fact that f is anti-symmetric under index interchange, and I distribute f lambda kappa into the green parentheses. Using the anti-symmetry under index interchange once more, we conclude that the derivative of L with respect to d mu a nu is negative f mu nu. Let us now go back to the Euler-Lagrange equation. The Lagrangian here only depends on the derivative of a, i.e. no explicit dependence on a directly. Therefore, the second term is zero. This gives us the equation of motion for the field F, or implicitly, for A, d mu f nu nu equals to zero. Looking back, the problem wants us to express this equation in the standard form by identifying the i-th component of E is negative f zero i, and epsilon ij k times k-th component of P is negative f ij. Here, i and j both range from 1 to 3, and epsilon is the Levi Civita symbol. Starting from our equation of motion, we can expand the summation of the dummy index mu into the zeroth component plus the ith component. Now, let us check various possible values of mu. If mu is 0, the first term vanish because f is anti-symmetric, leaving us with only the second term. Identifying that f i zero is the ith component of the electric field, and go back to the standard factor notation, this leaves us with the Gauss law in vacuum, that the divergence of the electric field equals to zero. Now, if nu is j, where j can be either 1, 2, uh, or 3, we can identify 
f 0 j in the first term as negative of the jth component of e, while in the second term, f i j is negative epsilon i j k times the kth component of b. We can make the negative sign in the second term disappear by swapping any of the epsilon indices. We can then go back to the standard factor notation, giving us Ampere's law in vacuum. Curl of B minus time derivative of E is zero. For the other two Maxwell's equation, the divergence of B and curl of E plus time derivative of B, they should already be satisfied implicitly by the definitions of A and F. To prove this, let us write the E and B in component form or in index notation. We can quickly write the i component of E using the definition of F as given in the problem. For B, we can start from the identity given by the problem and multiply by epsilon i, j, m. Here, m also ranges from 1 to 3. These two epsilons then reduce to 2 times delta km. Note that I am a bit loose with the subscript and subscript rule of Einstein's index notation, but this is not a problem because we are only dealing with spatial components and there is no zeroth component. Summing over the dummy index k on the left hand side and divide both sides by 2, we obtain the mth component of B in index notation. Now, we want to check if the divergence of B is zero. Let us switch to the index notation again. Divergence of B is D sub n Bm, substitute in B that we just found a second ago, and then plug in the definition of F. As mentioned before, since we are dealing with only spatial indices, we can freely move the indices up and down without a problem. Here, I move the index of the derivative down. Now, notice that the two partial derivatives, d sub n and d sub i, are symmetric, i.e. we can swap the indices i and m freely, but in the epsilon, the indices i and m are anti-symmetric. Swapping them will introduce a negative sign. We can therefore use the fact that the contraction of two symmetric indices with two anti-symmetric indices always, always is zero. We can say the same for the m and j indices for the second term. Therefore, we can conclude that the mu b mu is equal to zero. Hence, the divergence of b is zero. Let us now do the same analysis with the last Maxwell's equation. We switch to index notation and substitute in e and b in terms of f. We can then factor out the epsilon after swapping the indices around in the second term. Here, I swap the order of the indices of f so that the index k is the first index, just like in the first term. We then plug in the definition of f in terms of a, distribute the derivatives, and expand the expression as follows. The first term here vanishes because of the contractions between two symmetric and anti-symmetric indices. Now, notice that the remaining terms all have a similar indices, except for the second to last term that has j and k indices in the different position from the other terms. For the second term, we can rename the index k to be j and j to be k. But at the same time, we need to swap the order of j and k in the epsilon giving us a factor of negative 1. We can finally sum up all the addition and subtraction in the bracket, which all cancels out to 0. Therefore, 
the curl of E plus time derivative of P is equal to zero. And this is the Faraday's law. QED.